Hey everybody, welcome to 2ZQ Hot Takes, where we discuss issues both big and small. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and this time, I'll be talking about my British comedy thing. An appreciation of British comedies with appeal to American audiences. I am one of those people who snap to attention and at the very least mentally recite lines from my favorite British comedies. Other people I know, for some odd reasons, do not appreciate British comedy, and when the subject is brought up, their disposition changes and they make a sour face. Others attempt to display an appreciation by misquoting the shows and using a high voice, oddly. Still many others will recite lines from their favorite Britcoms with glee. Of course, to my mind, Monty Python's Flying Circus is the godhead. Everything that has made me laugh since I first saw Monty Python is as seminal as Laurel and Hardy, the Marx Brothers, the Three Stooges, Buster Keaton, Abbott and Costello, W.C. Fields, and Charlie Chaplin. Python is often equivocated as the comedy version of the Beatles, with John Cleese and Graham Chapman being the John Lennon, Eric Idle being, obviously due to their long friendship, George Harrison, Terry Gilliam being Ringo, and Terry Jones and Michael Palin being the Paul McCartney. Sort of. As an example, from CheatSheet.com, Eric Idle and George Harrison were good friends who bonded over their love of comedy. Idle said it was love at first sight when they met in the mid-1970s. However, the friends disagreed on a couple of things. While Idol soaked up everything the ex beatle said, George wouldn't listen to the Monty Python comedian's claims about David Bowie. Eric Idol met George Harrison at a screening for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And me, personally, I always thought the Beatles were connected with Monty Python through David Frost because most of them wrote for the David Frost show, That Was the Week That Was, and the Beatles had been guests on there. So I'm surprised that they met so much later. In his memoir, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, a sort of biography, Idol explained that he met George at a screening for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Idol wrote, I had heard that George wanted to meet me, but I was somewhat shy of meeting him. I was shy and tried to avoid him, but he snuck up on me in the back of the theater as the credits began to roll. I hadn't yet learned that he was unstoppable. We began a conversation that would last about 24 hours. Who could resist his opening line? We can't talk here. Let's go and have a reefer in the projection booth. No telling what the startled projectionist felt as a beetle came in with one of the actors from the movie he had just projected and lit up a joint. He managed eventually to get us to leave, and we went off to dinner with Terry Gilliam and Olivia Harrison. After dinner, George insisted I go with him to A&M Studios, where he introduced me to Joni Mitchell. Joni effing Mitchell, for Christ's sake. Saxophonist Tom Scott was at work on some overdubs of George's latest album, Extra Texture, and we listened to some of the tracks and then went back to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel where we talked and talked and talked for the rest of the night. What was it like to be a python? What was it like to be a beetle? A thousand questions. Idle told Rolling Stone, It occurred to me later that we both played similar roles inside our groups with big power blocks. Once I was moaning a little bit on Brian, saying, It was hard to get on screen with Michael Palin and John Cleese. He said, Well, imagine what it's like trying to get studio time with Lennon and McCartney. I said, All right, absolutely, got it, okay, check, I'll shut up now. Then it occurred to me that yes, in fact, we were slightly the outsiders playing similar roles in our groups. Idol tried to get George to be friends with David Bowie. The comedian was also close friends with David Bowie. 
Idol explained that Bowie wanted to collaborate with him on a Ziggy Stardust musical in his memoir. He asked me to collaborate with him in making a Ziggy musical, handing me a tape of Diamond Dogs to listen to, Idol wrote per Rolling Stone. I didn't know how to respond, so I said, it's very loud. Still, the pair became close, although that didn't make George like the glam rock singer. No matter how hard Idol tried, he couldn't get George to be friends with Bowie. Idol was like a sponge around George. He listened to everything he said, including his spiritual wisdom. However, George wouldn't hear how great Bowie was and didn't care. I would say to George, Bowie is wonderful and brilliant and funny. But then George would become very much a Beatle. Oh, Bowie, he would say contemptuously to rhyme with Bow Wow, Idol wrote. The Monty Python comedian said George always found the humor in a situation. George didn't listen to Idol about Bowie, but Idol continued to listen to George about spirituality. The comedian said the ex Beatle was his guru. George taught him how to live in the moment. Although comedy was Idol's specialty, George also taught him to find humor in every situation. In 1999, George and Olivia were attacked during a home invasion. Still, George found the humor when Idol called him about the attack. Idol wrote and George said, Why doesn't this kind of thing happen to the Rolling Stones? Since George died in 2001, Idol has supported his friend on multiple occasions. Idol and the rest of the Monty Python troupe performed at the concert for George. Idol will always support George's legacy. And now my own personal story about British comedy and the Beatles. My Neil Innes story. Now, Neil Innes is the actual connector between Monty Python and the Beatles. He wrote all the music for Monty Python's Flying Circus. He was the minstrel who followed Sir Robin, played by Eric Idle around, brave, bold Sir Robin, set forth from Camelot, and he played Ron Nasty in The Ruddles. He also wrote the incredibly brilliant Beatles parody music for The Ruddles. We went to see him perform at the original cutting room on West 24th Street. My seat was at a table in the front row close to the door from the dressing room or green room area. Just before the show was about to start, I was sitting there and suddenly I hear a voice and look up and see Neil Innes looking at me, asking me what time it is. Here is the one guy who played music with both the Beatles, John Lennon in particular, and Monty Python, staring me in the face and asking me what time it is. I was stunned. I told him what time it was, and he said, spot on, thumped my watch, and leapt up on stage and played everything I loved. I was ecstatic. May he rest in peace, one of my heroes, a true genius. Terry Jones was just amazingly funny. The funniest man who ever wore women's clothing ever. The only other people who come within a hundred miles of him in drag were the other pythons. Divine is the next funniest drag queen. I could go on for hours quoting lines from Python and other Britcoms. I pepper my conversations with lines from all of them every day. I have this heartfelt love for them. Python was exhilarating for a schoolboy being taught the concepts and themes that the pythons handily tossed about from philosophy existentialism and metaphysics to art to hoax cuisine to spam to just being silly and then they ignited passion within me which I keep alive every day the next funniest thing in the world to me is seasons 2 to 10 of the Simpsons but that's another podcast after Python Faulty Towers Faulty Towers was John Cleese's brilliant classic sitcom but Faulty Towers was more like a series of short plays which were excruciatingly funny. But the interplay between John Cleese, Connie Booth, who he co-wrote the show with and had been married to and divorced from, Prunella Scales, 
and Andrew Sachs is priceless. Honorable mention to Bernard Cribbins as Mr. Hutchinson in the Hotel Inspectors episode. Basil thought he was better than he was, and the tension between his desire for respect and the good life and the reality of his workday experience as a hotel keeper made everything hilarious. I can go on, but there were other shows to talk about. And Cleese has been the recent subject of self-created controversy over remarks made at an appearance he made in an Evening with John Cleese type of event. Now, next is a three-way tie between Blackadder, The Young Ones, and Absolutely Fabulous. All three are milestones in comedy, and all three are hilariously funny. I have to stop right there and say that all of these five programs mentioned so far reflected a basis in cultural reality, if that is a thing. They all reference current events and or history and definitely the zeitgeist. Blackadder was, I don't know if it still is, but it is factually correct and it has been taught in British schools to enhance learning because other than the main character, it is historically correct. The title character, played to perfection by Rowan Atkinson, is a wicked, self-serving opportunist, especially after the first series. They refer to the TV seasons as series across the pond. Now, I have to say that my appreciation stems from the fact that my mother was Irish, born in Dublin, and lived in Britain during World War II from age 14 or 15 or so until she was 25 when she moved to America with my dad after he was discharged as a sergeant from the U.S. Air Force. They met on Christmas Day in 1951 and were married in September 1952 in Britain. They lived in Cambridge at 3 Garlic Row. My dad had been stationed at Camp Milden Hall. So I have an ear for the accents, both British and Irish, and the idioms, which went rather far in my ability to pick up on and appreciate the subtle and bawdy humor the Brits and Irish are known for. I have to emphasize that this ability is relative to my American-born status and does not compare it to any native Brits or Irish people by any stretch. However, I was born predisposed, so to speak. The Young Ones. So much to say. The Young Ones is like Faulty Towers in that it consists of only 12 episodes, but boy, oh boy, were they jam-packed with a dizzying parade of British comedy stars new ideas, hilariously raucous sketches, and unforgettable lines and immortal characters. Rick Mayall, who has tragically left us, was utterly hilarious, as were the other three. They steadfastly, adamantly denied, and deny it to this day, but it really was the punk rock sitcom. So innovative, such a force of nature, so memorable, and at the time had an immeasurable impact on the British youth culture. Just amazing. University Challenge in Bambi is just about the funniest second act ever. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. The amazingly talented and prolific Ben Elton, who was the co-writer, along with Rick Mayall and Lisa Mayer of The Young Ones, as well as the co-writer, along with Richard Curtis of Blackadders, appears as a host of Nosin' Around, a youth-oriented show which satirized youth-oriented TV programming as well as Kendall Mintcake in Bambi, and as a bomb-throwing, rather fast-speaking, and rather articulate anarchist in Blackadder III. Now, we get to the next one. And I have to say that all three of these TV shows are interlaced with many of the same cast members making guest appearances, and they were all hilarious. And the surprises made the shows more exciting than they might have been just by their appearance. Everyone from Miranda Richardson to Emma Thompson to Hugh Laurie to Stephen Fry to Tony Robinson and Robbie Coltrane all appeared in each other's programs. The Young Ones was notable for employing the collective known as the comic strip with guest stars. Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders both appeared in The Young Ones, and Jennifer Saunders is married to Adrian Edmondson, otherwise known as Vivian Bastard, and Angus, the restaurant critic on Absolutely Fabulous. And of course, the follow-up shows, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap and Bottom, 
which never quite took off with American audiences, but they carried on the Young Ones tradition. Now, Absolutely Fabulous is about two decadent aging hangers-on to the remnants of pop culture of the past who were also out-of-place wannabes and or parasitic culture vultures. Patsy and Eddie are timeless. And it was about two women who were atrocious and unapologetic, who chased every frivolous trend they could attach themselves to while still attempting to hang on to faded youth and, awkwardly, that which had already been displaced. There's nothing like it in the world. I adore them, sweetie darlings. The five main cast members are called the five J's because all five of the leading characters' real names begin with the letter J. Jennifer Saunders, Joanna Lumley, Julia Sawala, June Whitfield, and Jane Horrocks. All of them brilliant. They are gay icons. Supremely so. Now, all of these shows so far, and a few to come, are, as I maintain, about people who you could never be able to endure being stuck with in a stalled elevator, which is what makes them so funny. So, on to Father Ted and the IT crowd. Unfortunately, Graham Lenahan, the creator and writer of both, has come on the side of J.K. Rowling with regards to trans people and has sown some discord with an obstinate disposition. However, Father Ted is amazingly funny, especially if you were raised Catholic, and especially, especially funny if you are Irish. Priceless. The IT crowd made the careers of both Richard Iowade and Chris O'Dowd. Enough said. Now we come to the middle class, upper middle class, white people's show, Keeping Up Appearances. Extraordinarily funny. Hyacinth Bouquet, or Bucket, the Bucket Woman, was listed as one of British school children's favorite characters. And I assume it is because she was such a stickler for so many rules of etiquette that have long since become obscure and obsolete. Because kids are such conformists, they want to know the rules and be like everyone else and show how bright and adaptable they are. Now to the cornier shows. Are You Being Served and Allo Allo? Full of double entendre and body prop humor. Both are crowd pleasers, but disrespected by hipper younger audiences because they represent a different time and mindset from the past. They still make me laugh. And John Inman played Mr. Humphreys, who was very obviously gay, but never quite acknowledged his sexuality on the show. Red Dwarf, a sci-fi comedy about a spaceship with people who have been in suspended animation for three million years, along with a hologram named Rimmer, played by Chris Barry. Enough said there. And of course, the extremely hip Ricky Gervais original The Office, which is painfully funny and somewhat tragic. Honorable mentions to Chef with star Lenny Henry. If you were in the restaurant business in the 90s when this show came on, it was your favorite show suddenly. He also appeared in The Young Ones as the Nazi mailman and The British Empire with Chris Barry, who also appears in Red Dwarf as Rimmer and Black Adder as a French revolutionary jailer. And the other uh, upper middle class shows as time goes by for older upper middle class white people with Jeffrey Palmer and Dame Judi Dench. Another British comedy with tremendous appeal to American audiences, which seems to have faded, is The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin and a similar program called Rising Damp, both starring Leonard Rossiter. The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin is about a man who fakes his own death and comes back and does everything deliberately the opposite of what he should have done and he becomes a wild success. It's extremely funny. As well as that Mitchell and Webb look starring David Mitchell and Rob Webb and Upstart Crow also written by Ben Elton about William Shakespeare starring David Mitchell from that Mitchell and Webb look. To the Manor Born Yet another upper-middle-class comedy about manners and privilege. 
The Good Life, starring Richard Bloody Breers and Felicity Treacle Kendall. Fleabag, starring Phoebe Waller-Bridge. The Catherine Tate Show. Gavin and Stacy, which co-starred and was co-written by James Corden. The Vicar of Dibley. The Young Offenders, about two teenage Irish dopes. Miranda, starring Miranda Hart as the awkward title character. My Family, about a middle-class family in Britain with dad as a dentist, but with Zoe Wanamaker, who also, as did Catherine Tate, appeared on Doctor Who. Catherine Tate's role as Donna Noble, the most important person in the universe, which she was completely unaware of, was co-starring on Doctor Who for several seasons or series, while Wanamaker played Lady Cassandra, who claimed to be the last pure human. But due to lots of surgeries, she is now only skin with a face that is stretched within a frame. She was a recurring character. And I would be completely remiss if I was to leave out the one and only Benny Hill, who made Boots Randolph's Yakety Sax known around the world. And everybody loved Benny. So there you have my take on British comedies that are popular with Americans. And of course, Monty Python at the top of the list was sketch comedy, as was that Mitchell and Webb look and the Catherine Tate show and not a sitcom. But I got to mention Doctor Who. Five points. Thanks for listening. See you next time. And as the kiddies say, peace out. Thank you.